Good morning, or you may be watching this in, at midnight. Whenever you do, it's good, whatever it is, and I'm glad you're here. And I want to say welcome to you. You know what welcome is? Welcome is the antidote. Welcome is the antidote to cliqueishness. When I say welcome on Sunday mornings, it's not as though I were the host of a party welcoming the guests. No, it's a reminder for all of us to welcome one another with open hearts and minds so that we might come to know one another and continue to stretch and strengthen the bonds of love and affection in our congregation. So the welcome is the antidote. It's always a reminder to be looking around for the person who's not included so that they will be included. Let's always be about that business of welcoming one another on Sundays and anytime we might encounter one another. Good morning and welcome. Our opening hymn this morning is May Nothing Evil Cross This Door. It's number one in the gray hymnal. Breathe. 
quote from the book One Minute Wisdom by Anthony DeMello. Spirituality. Even though it was the master's day of silence, a traveler begged for a word of wisdom that would guide him through life's journey. The master nodded affably, took out a sheet of paper and wrote a single word on it, awareness. The visitor was, per was perplexed. That's too brief. Would you please expand on it a bit? The master took the paper back and wrote, awareness, awareness, awareness. But what do these words mean? Said the stranger helplessly. The master reached out for the paper and wrote, awareness, awareness, awareness means awareness. May we strive to be aware as we say our affirmation. Love is our doctrine. Compassion is our way. Here we seek to create a joyful home for free religious exploration. Build a community of caring fellowship, nurture the hope, and serve the needs of our world. Each week, we light three chalices. The first is for members of this congregation the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Salem. We'd like our second chalice for our Unitarian Partner Church in Schiemann-Falva, Transylvania, Romania. And we'd like our third chalice for our children and youth in religious education and in the world at large. Notice the flame of each chalice. Notice how it changes depending on the size of the candle, the air, the wick. Each time the candle is lit, the flame becomes anew, growing, diminishing, adapting, becoming what it needs to be at the moment. May we strive to do the same in our lives. Please join me in singing the flame into life. Thank you. to tell you today is called Everything the Lord Does is for the Best by author Arthur Pittis. Rabbi Akiva was a wise teacher. Each year he went from town to town to beg for his students. These students spent all day long studying the Torah or the Word of God. One year Rabbi Akiva took his students with him these boys had never been as far from home as a mouse wanders from her nest. They took a donkey to carry the Torah, a candle to study it by, and a rooster to wake them at dawn. When they came to the first town, it was dark. They called to the gatekeeper to let them in. Open the gate, cried the students. Go away, cried the gatekeeper. But where will we sleep? cried the students. In the field, cried the gatekeeper. Come back when it's day. Don't worry, Rabbi Akiva told his students. Everything the Lord does is for the best. Let us sleep in the field. There will be grass for our donkey, we have our candle, and our rooster will wake us at dawn. So they found a place to sleep and lit their candle. But as soon as they began to study the Torah, the wind blew out their candle. Good master, said the students, we cannot study in the dark. Don't fear, said the teacher, everything the Lord does is for the best. A little later, the a roar of a lion woke them, excuse me. A little later, the roar of a lion woke them. 
It was eating their donkey. Let us run, cried the students. Silence, said the teacher. Do not fear. Everything the Lord does is for the best. No sooner had they fallen asleep than they heard the cry of a wild cat. It was eating their rooster. Let us run back to the town, cried the students. Silence, said their teacher. Do not fear. Everything the Lord does is for the best. At last the students fell asleep, and Rabbi Akiva set to watch until day. Wake up, my friends, said the teacher. God has given us a new day. And as they looked at the new day, a man ran towards them. It was the gatekeeper. Why are you running? The students asked. Last night, robbers broke into the town. They made everybody slaves and took them away. Only I got away. Now do you see, said Rabbi Akiva to his students, if we had been in the town, the robbers would have taken us as slaves too. If the donkey and the rooster had not been killed, the robbers would have heard them and found us and taken us away as slaves. And if the candle had not gone out, the robbers would have seen its light and found us and taken us away as slaves too. So always remember, my friends, everything the Lord does is for the best. Bokashem. Thanks be, and may all beings be happy. Please do consider joining us for the children and family service being held live via Zoom at 945 through the month of April, or for the children's RE program during both the 915 and 1030 services when we return to in-person worship in May. The RE program is seeking volunteers to help supervise these offerings. Thank you. Take a moment now to just be present in this moment. Breathing in, being grateful for the air that fills our lungs. As we slow down, we have the opportunity to become more aware. More aware of our community. Learned with great sadness this past week, a mother of three evicted on Christmas Eve, living in a homeless park in our community with her children, died this past week. So many, so many are disconnected from the compassion of others. And I think of our ritual of compassionate connection, where we sit and we share our stories, stories of heartbreak, stories of hardship, and we listen to one another, and tears are shed, and we hug, and we support one another. This ritual reminds us that everyone, everyone you see, is facing some challenge, some suffering. Let us be aware. Let us be aware. Let us be there to listen, to be present, to show compassion. There are many opportunities to do this. more than we might imagine. Compassion is our way. I 
and gratitude. On a walk in a late afternoon, I stop outside the temple, Beth Shalom, in my neighborhood. And I look at the sky and I see this glorious display of light shining down from the heavens on the tender leaves, slowly dancing out of the tree branches. Life is stirring. So much life. So much beauty. Such a wonder. Such a wonder. What a gift it is to be alive in this world. What a gift to have one another to share our joys and share our sorrows. May gratitude awaken our hearts to the beauty of this life, this world, that we might be fully present to enjoy our precious time together. Gratitude and compassion, we walk these paths together. Amen. Please be sure to continue to write your own joys and concerns on our website so that we may stay connected as a community. Thank you. Our pastoral hymn today is How Happy Are They? It's number 135 in the Gray Hymnal. Walk the labyrinth of my mind. Memories unfold before me in my path. 
patterns of things I have experienced before, I experience now, and yet, are they the same? What am I becoming? Where am I going? What should I be doing? I look into the stars and feel home. I know what is out there, yet I cannot speak the words. I've seen the sky before, near lakes and ocean shores, mountain peaks and valleys depths, and yet each time it is as if anew, and I am renewed. What am I becoming? I sit in silence among the many, breathing as though one. My eyes are closed, and yet I see colors, patterns, emptiness on which to float. There is something there beyond the clouds. I almost reach the source. It is home, a home I once knew and seek again within me, yet beyond. Dare I go? It's right out there, slightly beyond my reach. Where am I going? Achieve, achieve, extend and grow. There is so much to do, so much to give, so much to learn. Each new growth, a life amazement. Searching, adding on, paring down, surrendering to life. What should I be doing? And so the labyrinth wanders on, encircling again to begin again, reminding me to look again, learn again, and know again that it is unfolding as it should. Sometime around, uh, during the sixth year of my life, I decided it was time for a major change of scenery because the world in which I found myself just wasn't working out and I needed to find another one. In particular, first grade was not to my liking, especially since my teacher, who I never once saw smile, she seemed to really dislike me and had me pegged as a loser. I'd had enough. Other factors fed into my decision too, but I knew, I just knew it was time for a change. I was gonna run away. And I had a younger partner, five-year-old friend Pepe, who was not in school yet, but he was in because I was in. Already at my young age, I was in the business of leading people astray. Then came the day when we planned to make our break. It was all planned out. My mom worked outside the home. She left very early and was gone by the time I even got out of bed. The maid popped her head into the room, bedroom to ask what I wanted for breakfast before I was supposed to catch the school bus that would take me to the elementary school prison where I was serving time for the crime of being a kid. So scraps of wood and nails had been cadged from a nearby construction site, and we were building a raft out there in the woods next to a stream, a winding stream up in the woods behind our house in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where my family lived for a couple of years. And Pepe and I, we were going to ride upon this raft in this stream, and we believed and we fully imagined that it was going to take us beyond civilization, beyond all the craziness of the world 
in which I unfortunately found myself. It was going to take me away from all of that, and we were going to drift off into this sunlit paradise. It was going to be so wonderful. And so if Pepe and I were there in the woods, blissfully focused on building the raft on which we would float to freedom, suddenly the peaceful sounds of birds chirping in the forest was overridden by a familiar shrill voice calling out my name. Until that instant, it had not dawned upon me that I would be missed and that this might cause a problem for my mom who was at work many miles away when the maid called to tell her that her six-year-old son had disappeared. Predictably enough, parental and school authorities framed this whole episode purely in a negative light and let me know that I was a bad boy for running away. Running away never has gotten much good press. The thinking here being that you should just buck up and face whatever it is you're dealing with. You not run away. But today, as I think about my childhood adventure, I am inclined to entertain a more charitable, expansive interpretation. My boyhood vision of the paradise at the end of our rafting voyage, it had kind of a, a mystical aura about it. And I, I wonder now how it is that my six-year-old mind envisions such another world even to begin with. I think this says more about the human heart and mind than it does about me personally. The yearning for a, a better world, the desire to find liberation from bondage lies deep within every human heart. This is the yearning that has given birth to the great religious traditions which offer roadmaps to peace and love and joy and freedom. So given this rich history, when I face the school and parental authorities, I wish, I wish I had had the presence of mind to say to them, just as the Hebrews escaped from slavery in Egypt, so too did I seek to escape from the oppressive reign of Mrs. Lyerly, my first grade teacher, just as Prince Siddhartha, who would become the Buddha, left his palace to find liberation, so too did I leave my home for the same high purposes. So punish me if you will, but I was seeking to find a better way for all humankind. Wish I'd said that. I didn't have the presence of mind or the education at the time. So as it was, I had to face some unpleasant consequences, one of which was to have to stay within about three feet of my tormentor, Mrs. Lyerly, every day during recess for a month while the other children frolicked on the playground because I had been a bad boy, on top of now being a loser. And yet sometimes it really is, yes, sometimes it really is bad to run away and not face things. But sometimes, running away is just what's needed so you can get a fresh start. There's a strong history of this in American history paved by the feet of slaves who followed the light of the North Star to freedom. There's the spouse who finally manages to run away from an abusive situation. There are asylum seekers who leave home to find refuge from abuses and atrocities in their own country. A few years later, I hadn't, wasn't given up on this running away stuff. I, I made another furtive failed attempt to run away with another friend. This was a, a Pentecostalist preacher's son. He was a year older than me. He was undoubtedly the worst influence of my childhood. And I would just like to say, if there's anything at all that you don't like about me, it's his fault. It's his fault. So there I was, stuck in school. Every day for the last hour, I remember spending most of my time gazing impatiently at the clock, trying to will the hands to move towards three o'clock, the hour of freedom. Finally, a decade later, I was able to, the time was ripe, 
for me to make a clean break and run away from everything. I was at the beginning of my utterly miserable sophomore year at the State University. Lots of my peers were disillusioned and dropping out of school, and I followed suit. I got rid of all my belongings except for what would fit in my backpack. Some friends drove me to the entrance ramp of the freeway, and we bid one another tearful goodbyes, and I stuck out my thumb, and the first of many rides soon came to pick me up and take me on a new chapter of my life. After a harrowing and exhausting journey across the continent, I don't recommend hitchhiking, by the way, and don't let your kids hitchhike, all right? Let's, let's get clear on that. I, I did it, but I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. After a harrowing and an exhausting journey across the continent, I eventually landed at the Zen Buddhist Center in San Francisco. And it was there, it was there that I was finally able to get on the raft that would take me to a better world. What am I talking about getting on a raft? Well, long ago, the historical Buddha compared the meditation he taught to a raft that would help us cross the river of suffering over to the land of peace and freedom and well-being. So I was going to get on this raft. Finally, finally, I was going to be able to get on a raft that was going to take me to a better world. And yet just as I was beginning, just as I was embarking on this challenging journey to a new land of well-being on this meditation raft, I got the most disheartening news that just took the wind out of my sails. The Zen master who had founded San Francisco Zen Center, Suzuki Roshi, had died a few months before my arrival, but students had recorded his lectures and they had compiled them in a book entitled Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. It's one of the classics of modern, modern introductions to Zen. It's a great book. So in one of his lectures, Suzuki Roshi, and I read this lecture, it says, if you are sitting on your meditation cushion with the intention of getting enlightened, I was, yeah, that's, that's what I was doing. I was sitting on my meditation cushion with the intention of getting enlightened. That's why I was doing it. I, was, I wanted to be enlightened. I was tired of not being enlightened. I was tired of being afraid and anxious. I wanted to bliss out and be one with the universe. I wanted all my problems to be over. And so I was meditating to get enlightened, have all these problems solved. And then I read this passage from Suzuki Roshi. It said, if you are sitting on your meditation cushion with the intention of getting enlightened, you're not only wasting your time, you're actually creating karma that takes you further away from your goal. I, 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 I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I, it didn't make sense to me. I, I said, in other words, if I want to be enlightened, then I can't be. And if I don't want to be, why the hell would I ever sit on a meditation cushion with a painful posture like this to begin with? It, it didn't make any sense to me at all. Welcome to the paradoxes of the spiritual quest. You meditate to gain insight and wisdom, it's true, but if you meditate seeking that, then you're not meditating because your mind is wandering away from the present moment in time. To meditate, you don't do anything. You sit in a prescribed posture, focus your mind on your breathing, just letting go of thoughts that pull you away so that you can return again and again and again and again and again and again and again to the present moment. And if while you're doing your meditation, you're thinking, I want to get enlightened, I want peace of mind, I want freedom, you're not meditating, you're thinking about being enlightened. You're not doing the actual work. You're defeating your own purpose. And finally, it dawned upon me that Suzuki Roshi and many, many others who have expressed the same sentiment were right. When you sit to meditate, you stop, finally running away. There are so many ways to run away. You don't even have to leave home to do it. You can run away from yourself lounging on the sofa. 
and I'm not being judgmental here, I think everyone at one time or another will run away from things when life becomes intolerable for one reason or another. This urge to run away, to find something better is hard to resist, especially if you're in pain. And I think the urge to run away, to find a better solution, it should be respected. Run away, running away should always be explored as a viable option in many instances. Sometimes it could actually be the answer. And sometimes you may want it to be the answer, but it's not the answer. Sometimes you can only learn that running away doesn't work by running away and realizing that it didn't work, and it never will. As John Cabot Zinn, one of the uh, modern writers on Buddhist philosophy, writes, he says, you cannot escape it no matter where you run, for wherever you go, you are burdened with yourself. Wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you go, there you are. And when I sat in the meditation hall, my legs hurt like hell. And I wanted to move around and reposition myself and find that perfect, comfortable spot. But they don't like it when you do that. And when you try to do it, your new position quickly becomes painful too. And you want to find another less painful position. And they say, just knock it off. Just sit still. It's very frowned upon to do a lot of moving around. So you just sit there with your discomfort, with your pain. For some people, it's psychological pain. For me, it was just pure physical pain and discomfort. And I remember one meditation retreat I went to, seven days, every day you meditated an hour, half hour longer, seven days of wretched, miserable, bad meditation. It was just, I, didn't, I couldn't get it, I couldn't get into it. But I tried, I kept trying. And I came back to the city after this meditation retreat. And something had happened, I mean, it wasn't like, I think something happened. No, something had happened to my perspective. It had really changed. It had really changed. It was definitely more spacious, more appreciative of the deep beauty of this world. There was less frantic grasping in life. There was more just moment-to-moment -moment appreciation. There was more sensitivity to other people. And this was a palpable difference. And then I knew that this raft was taking me more deeply into the heart of life to greater wisdom and compassion and joy. And that experience, as I mentioned, came after a retreat when my meditation felt lousy. So many people think they're bad at meditation because it doesn't feel like what they think it's supposed to feel like. You're supposed to sit down and go into bliss. It's generally not like that at first. And so I think too many people give up at this, thinking they're no good at it, when in fact, a sincere effort does bear fruit, even if, it doesn't, even if you don't realize it at the moment. So getting onto this raft was pretty hard for me. I had some particular physical challenges around meditation that's taken me a long time to address, but I have. It's, it hasn't been easy, and I, I admit, I jumped off the raft <coughs> during my undergraduate and graduate school days because I, I convinced myself, hey, I gotta read all these books and write all these papers. I don't have time to meditate. Well, running away from meditation for a while showed me the value of the practice. By the end of theology school, I think it's a little ironic, all, all during theology school, I had no spiritual practice. And they didn't teach it, you to have it either. That wasn't part of the curriculum. You have to get that on your own. And so by the end of theology school, I was kind of a, an emotional wreck. There'd been too much study, too much stress. I don't think I meditated one time during that three and a half years I was in med ministerial training for the ministry. <clears throat> and then came the time I was stepping into the ministry and I realized I did not want to be another spiritual leader without a spiritual practice. And why I didn't want to be headed to eventual burnout. And so I took a vow. It was a very serious vow. We take vows in life. When we partner with people, we take vows in life and we promise something. Have you ever made a vow to yourself? 
a vow to yourself to do something that would really that you knew was good and it was going to really help you somehow I, I pulled this off I don't know how but I made a vow to get on the raft every morning and meditate not only for my own well-being for, but for the well-being of other people now I want to pause here for just a moment I've been talking all about meditation this morning I want you to know I am not a raft fundamentalist I'm not saying that only my raft will float my point is that there are practices that will help ground us and take us to a better world even if we stay in the same place. I've always found this practice to be challenging. It hasn't come easy, far from it, but it has slowly deepened over the years. It has grounded and strengthened me in facing adversity. It has helped me be more compassionate and it has deepened my appreciation and gratitude for this marvelous life we have together. The one we have now, the one I no longer want to run away from. Will you join me now for just a brief guided meditation? All of us are on a journey. A journey through this life. And we have choices we can make. Choices that will end us in the backwaters of resignation and regret and despair. Or choices that will help us enter the stream of life and flow freely. Every day of our life, we face choices to be here, to accept what comes to us, or to run away, to deny, to hide. Every day we walk the path, every day we choose our steps. You see that light up ahead, the light of love, compassion, and peace. Go in that direction. Go in that direction. And all will be well. Seva is Hindu for selfless service. The idea that a service to another person is performed that is beneficial to the person, but the giver does not have any expectation of the result or, or reward for such service. This idea is seen in many religious traditions, and one way it can be seen at UUCS is through the minister's discretionary fund. April Share the Plate Recipient. This is a fund that Reverend Rick can use at his discretion to help someone who needs help in a variety of ways, from food, paying a heating bill, getting to the doctors. Donating to the Minister's Discretionary Fund this month can help so many people hurting this year due, the, due, due to the pandemic, fires, ice, unemployment. There are so many reasons someone needs your help. So please consider donating to this Share the Plate recipient in addition to our regular support of the Marion Polk Food Share. You can do so by sending your checks to UUCS or visiting the website to donate. Thank you for maintaining both the community of UUCS as well as the greater community of Salem.
We take the light from our chalice, lighting the social justice candle as a symbolic reminder of the light and justice we carry out into the world. As we extinguish the chalices, another quote from the book One Minute Wisdom by Anthony DeMello, Development. To a, a disciple who complained the limitations, the master said, you noticed you can do things today that you would have thought impossible 15 years ago? What changed? My talents changed. No, you changed. Isn't that the same thing? No, you are what you think you are. When your thinking changed, you changed. I hope you'll consider sticking around after the service today. We have a Zoom fellowship hour and you can figure out how to register for it uh, by going to our website and going to the calendar there. So it gives you a chance to, even during this time, make uh, social contact with people over, over the Zoom fellowship. So please join us for that today. Uh, also, if you would like to uh, continue connecting with people. Please notice that we have a new program called Circle Cocktails and Conversation. And we're going to have some great conversations uh, beginning on April 16th, 17th, and 18th. Just an opportunity to uh, discuss a lot of topics and uh, share our thoughts and ideas. And, and so thanks for organizing that, uh, Sarah. Uh, Hey, by the way, we're getting, it's getting close to May, isn't it? The second Sunday, May the 2nd, the first Sunday in May, we're going to begin having in-person services again. We, we believe that it's safe. We're going to have two services on Sunday morning so we can maintain social distancing in the sanctuary and so we don't have to turn anybody away who comes on Sunday morning. So we'll be having a Sunday service at 9.30 and 11.15. We'd love to see you. Please do join us for that. Also, uh, I would like to invite you, I think there's still time to sign up for the Irshad Manji class. We're having a class that's beginning on uh, when, this, this coming Wednesday. Uh, it's a class we're sharing with uh, Unitarian Universalists from a few other different congregations. There's well over 100 of us have signed up for it, but we'd really love to see as many people as possible sign up for this class, uh, uh, Diversity Without Division. Look on our website for how you can be part of that too. You can see there are appeals to volunteers to help with the reopening, finding hosts, and uh, also a choir kit sitting right over here to my left is going to be uh, working on a virtual singing opportunity, and all musicians are welcome. So talk to Dr. Kitt if you're interested in that. And I think that's probably enough for the announcements. Thank you. Our closing hymn today is We Would Be One. It's number 318 in the gray hymnal.
please join hands, either literally or figuratively, and join me in saying that our closing words. May faith in the spirit of life, hope for the community of earth, and love for the sacred in one another be ours now and in all the days to come.